Welcome class to part five. In part five, we'll talk about the central nervous system. And before we do so, we want to go over a couple of definitions. So we already know what a nerve is. Okay, um, we want to know what a pathway or a tract is. Pathway or a tract would be a group of axons found within the CNS. So a group of axons found in the peripheral nervous system, we term that as a nerve. A group of axons within the CNS is known as a pathway or tract. Tracts can either be ascending tracts towards the brain, and those would be carrying senses. So those are sensory tracts. So sensory or ascending tracts. Other tracts are descending away from the brain. Those are motor tracts. A commissure would be a fibers that connect the right side of the CNS to the left side. So we will talk when we get to the structure of the brain, we will find that there are neurons that cross over to the opposite side. And again, connecting the right side of the CNS to the left side. Now the difference between a ganglion and a nucleus, and in this case, we are not talking about the nucleus of a cell. So um, forget the nucleus of the cell that we talked about in a previous chapter. These are totally different kind of nuclei. Ganglia and nuclei are a collection of neuron cell bodies. If that collection of the neuron cell bodies is found in the CNS, we call that a nucleus. Nuclei would be the plural. If the collection of the cell bodies are in the peripheral nervous system, we call that a ganglion or plural ganglia. Okay. Um, the breakdown of the nervous system is your CNS made out of the brain and spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system made out of the nerves coming out of these. The nerves coming out of the brain are cranial nerves. We have 12 of those. And we also have spinal nerves coming out of the spine. If you break them down according to the information carried on the nerve, we either have sensory or afferent division. And that those senses could be somatic senses, and those are the senses that come out from the um, skin, for example. So pain, temperature, touch, those are all somatic senses. We also have visceral senses, and those come from the inside of the body. So feeling the fullness after eating, the feel, full, um, a full bladder, for example. These are examples of visceral senses. Special senses are related to the senses that come out of the head. So vision, smell, taste, hearing, and equilibrium are all special senses. Coming to the efferent division or the motor division, that would either innervate a skeletal muscle, and we know we call that division the somatic motor division, meaning that that's the part of the nervous system that we have voluntary control over. So I can decide whether or not to contract a muscle, okay, the skeletal muscle, but our smooth and cardiac muscles, those are controlled under the autonomic nervous system. So these would control, the autonomic nervous system controls your involuntary muscles. And depending on the situation, so if you, it could be either under the effect of the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic or the enteric. And the enteric, again, is related to the viscera. So let's talk about the development of the brain. The brain starts to develop at about four weeks. It is made out of a tube known as the neural tube. The tube is made out of three different parts, the forebrain, midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain will eventually develop into the cerebrum and the diencephalon. If you're not sure what those are in particular, we'll take a look at it in the next slide. That green midbrain will develop into the midbrain or the brainstem. And the hindbrain develops into the rest of the brain stem, so the pons and the medulla, and it also be develops into the cerebellum. Here you can see the different parts. So the cerebrum 
is what we usually tend to think of when we think of brain. Okay, so these different lobes and the diencephalon is all of these structures that are in the middle. So you have, for example, um, the thalamus, you have a pituitary gland, there's the hypothalamus, um, all of these are parts of the diencephalon. And the cerebrum and the diencephalon, again, both of those develop from, from the forebrain. The midbrain develops into the midbrain that is um, the very first part of the brainstem, while the hindbrain will develop into the pons and the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. We are going to be going kind of back and forth to this slide in order to go over different structures. So your forebrain, again, is made out of the left and the right cerebral hemispheres. And again, this is what we usually think of when we say the word brain. It is made out of the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex is grayish in color. So if you take a section of the brain, a mid-sagittal section of the brain, and you look at um, the colors, you will find that on the outside, um, the cerebral cortex is grayish in color, while the inner side, the inner layer, is more whitish in color, and we call that the white matter. The gray matter is made out of the non-myelinated cell bodies, while the white matter is made out of the myelinated axons. But deeply embedded within that white matter, we also have different nuclei. Remember we said these nuclei are a collection of cell bodies in the CNS. And because it's underneath the cortex, they are known as the subcortical nuclei. So let's take a look at this section of the brain. Okay, so this is a coronal section. And you can see here the two, uh, you know, the right and the left sides of the brain. You can see the cerebral cortex made out of the gray matter, again, the non-myelinated cell bodies. And then the white matter, those are the myelinated axons. You can also see embedded within the white matter, we have these different nuclei. They are obviously not co really color-coded, but they would be gray in color. And those are known as the subcortical nuclei. Okay, in some older books, they are known as the basal ganglia, but the correct name is the basal nuclei. Uh, we can see what is known as the corpus callosum that translates into the colossal body, and these are commissure fibers. They connect the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. There is also a cavity within each cerebral cortex, those are the lateral ventricles. And then there's a cavity in the middle that is the third ventricle. You can also see the two thalami, so a right and a left thalamus, those are the orange structures. There, we have a right and left of those. The hypothalamus underneath it and then the hypothalamus connects to the pituitary gland through a stalk no, known as the pituitary stalk or the hypothalamic pituitary stalk. The cerebral cortex has lots and lots of cell bodies, and that's why, again, it is gray in color. The two different kinds of cells we want to um, know about are pyramidal cells and the non-pyramidal cells. So pyramidal cells, these get, they get the name because of what they look like. So they kind of look like pyramids. They convey or they um, are motor fibers. The non-pyramidal cells, so the remaining cells that you see here that are non-pyramidal, for example, like this one and this one, those are involved in senses. So those would be sensory fibers, while the pyramidal cells are involved in motor function. So again, we saw the right and left cerebral hemispheres. We saw the corpus callosum, which are the commissure fibers connecting the right side to the left cerebral hemisphere. 
we did not introduce the lobe. So let's go back to this image right here. So each cerebral hemisphere has five lobes. There is the frontal, frontal lobe in the front, the parietal lobe a little uh, behind it, and then the occipital lobe all the way in the back. There's a tongue-shaped lobe known as the temporal lobe. The insula, which is the fifth and the last lobe, is named because it is insulated. So you really cannot see the, insula, the um, insula lobe in this image. You would have to push the temporal lobe away. It's hiding deep to the temporal lobe. The cerebral cortex is about three millimeters thick, but it is there are lots and lots of folds. Okay, so the um, and all of that folding increases the surface area. So there are lots of neurons in there, be, um, thanks to the fact that it is highly folded. The folding leads to these ridges, and we call these ridges or the elevations, we call them gyri, that's the plural, or gyrus, that would be one. The grooves are known as either a sulcus, which is one, or sulci, and that is plural. The, um, we already talked about that the cerebral cortex has, you know, these different layers of cells. And to focus on the pyramidal cells versus the non-pyramidal. So your pyramidal cells are the motor related to the motor cortex. The non-pyramidal cells are more related to sensory um, information. The cerebral cortex is obviously um, a very complex um, structure. Okay, and a lot of it, it you have... Um, you know, pr primary areas, and you also have integrating areas. And there is a difference between them. So a primary area would be where you would um, sense something, for example. An integrating area would be how you understand that sense. So I'll give you an example. For instance, the occipital lobe is responsible for, it has the primary vision area. So you look at a picture and you see it. That is pretty much it. The visual integration center that is also in the occipital lobe explains to you what you just saw. Okay, so kind of like if you look at a foreign language in a, um, letters that you are not familiar with, you are seeing it with your visual cortex, but you have no idea what you're looking at. That means your integrative function for that particular language is not there. So there is a difference between sensing something and understanding um, and um, reacting to what you just felt. Okay, so again, the integrating centers are kind of like a higher um, level function as opposed to the primary centers. Underneath the cortex, as we mentioned, there are a group of cell bodies, we call those the basal nuclei. Okay, and those are, um, they function in controlling movement and posture and a little bit about the more kind of complex behavior. Okay. The diencephalon is the part that is deep within, um, deeper or underneath the cerebrum. It's made out of the thalamus Underneath it, an area known as the hypothalamus, and then above the thalamus, an area known as the epithalamus. The thalamus, again, we have two thalami right and left, is basically a collection of um, cell bodies, and they're, so hence we're going to call them nuclei. And this is where a lot of the senses have to relay. And we'll see that the thalamus has an important role in general, arousal. Arousal means um, how conscious the person is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to chapter eight. But um, thalamus is also involved in focusing attention. So it is responsible for filtering out things that we don't need to know. So thalamus is your sensory filter. Everything that we sense or that stimulates our sensory receptors would have to go through the thalamus. The thalamus decides 
if these things are important, it will send it to the cerebral cortex and we will actually perceive these. Other things that are considered not important are, will be filtered out and we won't even experience them. So um, again, your thalamus is your sensory filter. So I'll give you another example. So let's say for instance, you, um, okay, so when my kids were younger, I had to be able to filter out all of that noise so I can concentrate on what I'm doing. You get used to that, okay? So I am able to filter out all of the noise that the kids were making. Do you think, you know, I would thank my thalamus for that. So it can um, focus my attention to say, you know, whatever I'm doing, whatever the task was at the time, and filtering out all the noise and the cartoons and everything else that was going on in the house, okay? Again, your thalamus does that for you. Another thing the thalamus does would be um, everything, again, all of the senses would go to the thalamus first, and then the thalamus decides where would it go to the in the cerebral cortex. So again, we see with our eyes, the optic nerve, and that's the nerve that carries vision towards the brain. But it would have to go to the thalamus. The thalamus decides, oh, this is something that's vision. So it needs to go to the occipital cortex. Okay, so it's kind of like that um, tell, guide telling the different senses where to go in the brain. The hypothalamus has a lot of nuclei, so again, gathering of cell bodies, and it is that connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So it does have both a neural function and an endocrine function. The, um, it is responsible for the behavior that helps us um, survive as an individual, so eating and drinking. It also is responsible for behavior that allows us to survive as a species. So reproduction, for example. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland through that pituitary stalk. And again, we'll get more into that when we talk about the in the endocrine system. The epithalamus is a portion of the brain that is above the thalamus. It includes a little tiny gland known as the pineal gland. That gland releases a hormone called melatonin, and melatonin is the sleep inducer. Okay, so um, when it's time to go to bed, when it, your normal bedtime comes, the levels of melatonin rise, and that would lead to sleepiness. So you can also actually find melatonin kind of like over the counter to be used as a sleeping aid. The, um, I wouldn't recommend it though, but it is there. Okay, so parts of the forebrain also um, enter into making what is known as the limbic system. The limbic system is not actually one part of the brain. It's a whole collection of different parts and they are all associated with learning, emotional experience and your behavior. And again, that will be covered a lot more in chapter eight but I am going to kind of briefly introduce you to the limbic system and the fact that it is not one part of the brain. These are a group of structures working together. So for example, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, parts of the frontal lobe, the olfactory bulb and that carries smell, the hippocampus, and that's more related to memory. Um, all of these together form um, parts of the limbic system. There are more, but for now, again, know that the limbic system is not like a, a one part of the brain. It's a lot of different parts working together. The cerebellum is responsible for coordination of movement, controlling posture and balance. So it does not give orders to the skeletal muscles to contract. That is the job of your frontal cortex. But what it does do is coordinate how the movement will occur. 
So what is going on is that the cerebellum gets information constantly from the different parts of your body. So it gets information from joints, muscles, tendons, um, from your eyes, ears, and so on, telling you where you are in relationship to the other parts of your body, where you are in relationship to the furniture in the room. And all of that has to converge onto the cerebellum. The cerebellum analyzes all this data and decides how are you going to avoid getting bump or bumping into that chair, for example. So I need to maybe flex my elbow. When you flex your elbow, you want to contract your biceps and relax the triceps muscle. So that coordination of that muscle activity is the, the that planning is done by the cerebellum. But the cerebellum sends the plan to the frontal cortex, then the frontal cortex sends the orders to the muscles, to your biceps to contract and your triceps to relax. Okay, so again, the cerebellum does not initiate the voluntary movement, but it does coordinate the movement and it controls posture and balance. It receives information from muscles, joints, skin, eyes, and so on, knowing what's going on in the environment. So even if you have your eyes closed, you can know if your right knee is flexed or extended. Again, if you are able to do that, thank your cerebellum for that. Okay, so cerebellum is mainly involved in the coordination of motor activity. There are research, there is research showing that it might also be involved in learning, but that is still all, um, you know, kind of early to tell. Now the brainstem is what connects the cerebrum to the spinal cord. So anything that goes into or out of the brain has to go through the brainstem. There is a whole bundle of axons in the brainstem known as the reticular formation. It is ex the reticular formation or the RF is extremely important and essential for life. The reticular formation are kind of clustered together to make the different nuclei and different integrating centers. So these nuclei are important for vital functions like breathing. So there's a breathing center or the respiratory center, cardiovascular, and that is responsible for the heart and blood vessels. It also has centers for swallowing and vomiting. Okay, so again, you know, these centers are not really found in the cortex, but they are found within the brainstem. It also has nuclei involved in eye movement control and reflexive behavior or reflexive orientation of the body in space. The brainstem, um, again, anything ascending or descending to the cerebrum would have to pass through it. It has um, a lot to do with regulation of sleep and wakefulness. So that reticular formation is one of those filters that would help in filtering, um, filtering out noise. Usually you want to think of it maybe as like kind of like as a gate. So when you're sleeping, the reticular formation keeps you asleep. Okay, so there might be noise going on, on the, um, somewhere outside, but you don't wake up. But if, um, if your baby, say, is crying, okay, and even if it's not too loud, the reticular formation knows that that is important information and it will let it slip through the gates and wake you up. So again, it's really important to regulate sleep and wakefulness and focus attention. The brain stem also has the nuclei for 10 out of the 12 cranial nerves. So remember we said the nerves that come out of the brain are called cranial nerves. We have 12 pairs, so 12 on the right and 12 on the left. 10 out of those 12 originate from the brain stem. Now the spinal cord are all of the tracts that and um, runs right into in the uh, vertebral column 
surrounded by all of that bone to protect it, it is a very, it's made out of very soft tissue. Okay, so if you've ever dissected um, an, a real spinal cord, it is very fragile. As soon as you touch it, it will um, really kind of disintegrate. So it's, it's very fragile, needs a lot of protection by all that bone. And if you make a section in the spinal cord, this is what you look like, or this is what it, it looks like, rather. Okay, so we have this gray butterfly, and that is the gray matter surrounded by the white matter. So remember in the cerebral cortex, it was the opposite. In the cerebral cortex, we had the gray on the outside, white on the inside. In the spinal cord, switch that. Okay, so the gray is on the inside. So these are your cell bodies. While the white, these are the myelinated fibers. So these again are either ascending tracts carrying sensory information to the brain or descending tracts carrying motor information to the effectors. The gray matter is made out of three horns. There's a dorsal horn, a ventral horn. There's also a lateral horn, but it's not showing here. The white matter is made out of fasciculi. There's a dorsal, lateral, and ventral fasciculus. Okay. There are also fibers connecting the right to the left side, and that is known as the commissure, or the commissure fibers. In the middle, that little um, opening is known as the central canal, and that's where CSF would be found. Coming off of the spinal cord, we have spinal nerves. Now, each spinal nerve is made out of two roots. There is a dorsal root and a ventral root. The dorsal root carries sensory information to the spinal cord. The motor root, or the ventral root, carries motor information away from the spinal cord. So in order to remember that, re remember that ventral is anterior or the front, dorsal is posterior or the back. So if you have a car, unless you own an antique car, but if you have, you know, a regular car, um, the motor of the car is in the front. So your motor root is your front or ventral root, while the sensory, the dorsal root is your sensory. We have what is known as the dorsal root ganglion, which again is a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Now, both of these roots combine to make a spinal nerve. So a spinal nerve is mixed, made out of both sensory and motor fibers. The spinal nerve is then going to branch. It is Spinal nerves are very short. They are going to branch into to, um, two branches. There is a dorsal branch, also known as the dorsal ramus, and a ventral branch known as the ventral rami. These branches are also mixed, so they will also have sensory and motor fibers in them. As we already mentioned that the spinal cord have, has lots of tracts, either ascending, carrying sensory info towards the brain, or descending, carrying motor information from the brain down to the effectors. The, um, the gray matter has the cell bodies for your dorsal root, and the dorsal root ganglia is a collection of the cell bodies um, in or very close to the spinal cord, so it's in the peripheral nervous system while the ventral root carries motor information towards the spinal cord. Again, both of these roots combine to make a spinal nerve that is mixed, has mixed fibers, meaning it has both sensory and motor fibers. Now we'll take a break before we go ahead to our sixth and final part of chapter six.